We're talking about ionic and covalent compounds. Last chapter, we were just talking about elements. And you, some elements lose electrons to make cations, and some elements gain electrons to make anions. But we were just talking about elements, atoms kind of by their lonesome. Okay. Now we're going to start talking about what happens when you put different elements together and they react and they make compounds or basically things that have two different types of elements in them, okay? Okay? Today we're going to talk about electron dot diagrams. How do we make those? Okay, another word for these is Lewis dot diagrams, okay? It's basically just the symbol of the element with dots around it that represent how many valence electrons these uh, these atoms have. Okay, you're going to find out that this is not rocket science. Okay, let me give you some examples. Sulfur. Last time I checked on sulfur, it's in group 6A. All right, that means sulfur has six valence electrons. Here's how I fill it in. Okay, just kind of do a little ring around sulfur here. Okay. Got four electrons, and then we got to put two more in. I'll just start kind of doubling it up. Okay? Just put six dots around sulfur. Sulfur's got six valence electrons. Put six dots there. Okay? Barium. Okay? That is in group two. Barium has two valence electrons, so I'm just going to put two dots around barium. Okay? Krypton. Marcella, what about krypton? Where does that fall? On the periodic table. <laughs> What's that last group? It's group 18, or otherwise known as group 8A. There's eight valence electrons. It's a noble gas. It is happy just like it is. Okay. It has to practice some dot diagrams. <clears throat> okay, uh, just kind of double check your answers with my answers here. It really doesn't matter how you arrange these things around the atom. It's just meant to show that you know what's going on with the valence electrons. Okay. Simple stuff. Okay, now let's review review the octet rule, okay? Atoms want to get to a full valence shell. Okay, that's what the octet rule states, all right? Otherwise stated. An atom wants to get to the electron configuration of a noble gas, okay? So, metals are going to lose electrons to get there. Uh, Non-metals are going to gain electrons to get there. But everybody's going to end up with eight electrons at the end of the day, okay? So, we're going to get into ionic bonding, okay? Now, an ionic bond is formed when electrons are transferred from a metal to a non-metal, I would go ahead and underline in your notes metal and non-metal. You need a metal and you need a non-metal. Okay, metals are on the left-hand side of the period, left-hand side of the staircase, right? Non-metals are on the right-hand side of the staircase, but that is your prerequisite to have an ionic bond form. Okay. I wanted to show you what it looks like when we look at the boron, uh, the boron, the bore models of our atoms. Okay, let's say we have sodium. Okay, this is sodium. This is what the bore model looks like for sodium. Notice that there is one electron in the valence shell for for sodium, and then we have chlorine. Notice that there are seven electrons in the valence shell for chlorine. In the outside shell, there are seven electrons. What's going to happen? Well, sodium is going to lose its electron. The electron's going to hop over 
to chlorine. What does that do? Well, that leaves sodium with an ultra-stable uh, octet in its outer shell, right? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And guess what chlorine gets? You add one electron to chlorine, you get an ultra-stable octet for chlorine. Now, what happens to sodium when you lose an electron? You gain a positive charge, right? Chlorine gains a negative <coughs> charge, okay? So sodium becomes positive, chlorine becomes negative. You get an ionic bond. We'll talk about what that means here in a sec. Okay, here's another example. All right, this is lithium. This is chlorine. Lithium is going to donate an electron over to chlorine. Chlorine's going to get a negative charge. Lithium's going to get a positive charge. Remember, when you're dealing with lithium, hydrogen, or helium, the stable configuration is two electrons on your outside. Okay? Now, what does this mean for metals? Okay? Metals are going to lose their valence electrons, and that's going to make a complete octet in the next lower energy level. Okay? Let's talk about what happens to the electron configuration. All right? The electron configuration of sodium is shown here, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. And what happens when sodium loses its electron? You get rid of this last one here, right? And then you end up with sodium plus 2s2, 2p6, all right? Now, one thing I want to say about naming, and you should write this down, when a metal loses an electron to make its cation, the name does not change, okay? So sodium atom and sodium ion with the same, it's the same word, it's still sodium, okay? Now, the half reactions, and we'll learn a lot about, a lot more about half reactions later. If we're gonna show this formally as a, as a reaction, you'd say sodium, arrow, sodium goes to sodium plus and then a free electron <coughs> out there, okay? Magnesium, on the other hand, Magnesium loses two electrons, right? Because it's got two valence electrons in its, in its outer shell. So magnesium is going to form a magnesium ion and then liberate two electrons. Okay, we'll get into this a little bit more. Okay, for nonmetals, okay, the important thing is here, you should underline this, nonmetals gain electrons. Okay. And by gaining electrons, they fill out their octet. They make eight electrons, okay? Notice chlorine atom. We really don't care about all these inside electrons. What we do care about are these outside guys, okay? Chlorine has seven electrons. Two plus five equals seven. Seven electrons in its outer shell, okay? Now, when it gains an electron, let's ignore all these guys. When it gains an electron, that 5 turns into a 6. Okay, you get 8 electrons in the valence shell. Now, here's the important part. We call chlorine, we call the atom chlorine when it's in its neutral state. Once chlorine gains an electron, we change the name to chloride. Okay, so the I-N-E is going to turn to an I-D-E once you gain the electron. Okay, here's how we would show it as like a, a half reaction. You add, we're adding an electron to chlorine to make chloride. For oxygen, oxygen's got space for two more electrons, right? So now we'd add two electrons to oxygen, oxygen to make oxide, all right? Take the ending off, put IDE on, okay? And then you may hear me use the word halide, okay? When I say halide, I just mean anything that's in that halogen group. Once we make the ions of that halogen group, we call it halides, okay? So let's see if we uh, can figure this out. So Derek, okay, fluorine, we add an electron to fluorine. What would we call it after that? Call it a negative ion, but what would be the, the, the name of it? Take I-N-E, turn it to I-D-E. Fluorine, fluoride, okay? 
Chlorine, chloride. What about bromine? Bromine will turn into bromide, okay? But the general name for all those are halides. Okay? So, here's the crux of what I want to talk about today. Ionic compounds. You guys know what a compound is, right? It's just something that's got two different elements in it, okay? And what happens when you transfer an electron from a metal <coughs> to the non-metal? We've got a little cartoon of what's going on up here. Notice sodium loses its one electron, goes to chlorine, and then chloride, okay? What happens is sodium becomes positively charged. Chlorine becomes negatively charged, okay? And what do we know about things of opposite charge? Opposites attract. Okay, the fancy word for that is called the electrostatic force. Okay, but when you say electrostatic force, you're basically just saying that opposites attract. Okay, sodium's positive, chloride is negative, they stick together. That is an ionic bond. Okay, just two oppositely charged particles sticking together. Okay, what I want you to do right now is go through these elements and give me the dot structures for these elements and then I'll, sh and then I'll show you how to uh, write down the dot structures of the ionic compounds that they form. So, uh, I'm just going to draw me Okay, so we're going to make the ionic compound of sodium and chlorine, okay? So, notice that chlorine has one space where you can put an electron. This electron from sodium jumps over to chlorine to make chloride, and what you end up getting is something that looks like this. This is how I would show it, okay? Sodium sticking to chloride. See if you can do magnesium and oxygen on your own. Well, magnesium's got two electrons to give. Oxygen needs two. So one electron's going to jump up top. One electron jumps on the bottom. What's the charge on magnesium going to do? Positive two. Oxygen is going to turn into negative two, right? Because it just gained two electrons. Okay, so it's easy to draw these dot structures for the compounds that one needs one and the other has one to give, all right? Everything evens out. But sometimes you put you try to put two elements together that need and can give different amounts of electrons. Okay? Case in point, calcium and bromine. Calcium's got two electrons to give, but bromine only needs one. So how are we going to solve that? Well, I'll give you a hint. Calcium is always going to form a plus two charge, and bromine is always going to form a minus one. What did you say, Marcel? So we'll add this one here, right, because bromine needs one. But what about this other one? What if we add another bromine? So when the when the chart when the 
number of electrons that are given and are going to be gained are different, you have to change the numbers of elements. So calcium, 2 plus, and the way I would show it is 2 bromines. So in order to even out the charges, you have to, sometimes you have to change the number of anions or, or cations. <coughs> and that's how I would show it, okay, with the dot diagrams. See if you can guess what uh, sodium and sulfur are going to do. <coughs> sulfur needs two, right? It's got six. Sodium's only got one to give, so what do we have to do? Got to put another sodium in there. So you could write it like... Okay. Xander. Right. We're going to get to how we how we formally write that. For the, for now, I just kind of want you to write it in this form. Okay. And this is how it would look for that when you add two things to one thing. Okay. Calcium's got two to give. The chlorine only needs one each. So calcium is going to give one electron to the upper chlorine, the second electron to the lower chlorine, and this is how you would write it out in the Bohr model. And notice, Xander, that we're starting to put subscripts. You don't really have to do that <coughs> now, but we're going to learn more about that later. Okay, so go through and fill in the, uh, the ions, or the, the ion compounds for these practice problems. Don't forget to put the charges on there. Um, and also, if you want to leave, say for these bromines that are down here, if you don't want to go through the trouble of adding all eight, um, that's fine, um, as long as you understand that we're dealing with things that now have a full octet. Um, for example, magnesium right here. I didn't write down all the eight electrons that are in magnesium, but magnesium does have a full octet, okay? I'm just representing magnesium as not having any electrons in its third energy level. It lost those, okay? <coughs> 